Good uh, morning, everyone. My name is Nadia Kenner. I'm a research associate with the UK Data Service. And yeah, thank you for coming to this introductory talk on time series analysis and forecasting. I'm gonna just give it a couple more minutes as uh, people are still entering and then I'll uh, get started with the introduction slides. So here is the content for today. We're gonna to be discussing what is time series data. And we'll look at how this is different to non-time series data. We discussed uh, what time series analysis is, also known as TSA. We look at the different types of TSA, the components that then make up this TSA. We look at fitting time series models and how we can train our data to then be able to create uh, forecasts, which are you know predictions. And then we briefly discuss the available software to run this type of analysis. <clears throat> so what exactly is time series data? It can be said to be a collection of observations obtained through repeated measurements of time. So each instance represents a different time step and the attributes give values associated with that time. So the intervals for which time series are represented are typically quite vast in that you can have, you know, hourly data, yearly data, monthly, quarterly, etc. But the decision of what time interval to use is dependent not only on your like research questions, but also the data that you have at hand, because this will identify what type of models you can or are able to run. Um, <clears throat> there are three main characteristics of time series data. The first being that the data arrives is almost always recorded as a new entry. Second, the data typically arrives in time order. And lastly, time is a primary access. The time intervals can be either irregular or irregular. Typically, time series are assumed to be generated at regular space intervals of time, and, also, and these are known as your regular time series. Um, the data typically will include like a timestamp like we saw in the previous slide. Uh, but not some data is also irregular. Typically, you'll be working with regular time series, so it's not um, you don't need to worry about how to change an irregular series to a regular because most data typically arrives in regular, uh, like a regular fashion. But an example of an irregular time series would be something like withdrawals from an ATM machine, for example. But the key point to remember is that when running time series uh, analysis data points are recorded at regular intervals over a set period of time, rather than intermittently or, you know, like randomly. But you might be asking yourself, so like how is time series data different to non-time series data in that, if we have a time series data that has a time field, does that just automatically make it time series data? What about cross-sectional data? Can that be considered time series? What about pool data, you know? And these are the type of questions that um, you know will help you to distinguish the difference between the two. But these questions can be answered um, by, you know, it all depends on how your data has been collected, as this affects how we can then analyze changes and state over time. Um, I use the word changes as this is a like really key concept in understanding time series data. The major difference between the two is that. For time series data, time, the time factor is the dependent component. And for non-time series data, this isn't typically a central theme. So time series data can get confused with other types of data types. Um, when I first started on time series data, I had uh, issues understanding like, you know, the different data structures. So I've created some questions where you can have a go at matching the data types to the correct definition, just to uh, broaden your understanding. So we'll start off with time series data. Can you select the right definition for time series data? So if you want to head back to Mentimeter and pop in your votes, and then we can go ahead and discuss answers. Do you think that time series data consists of several variables recorded at the same time? Is it data that collected sequentially from the same respondents over time? Or is this data that's recorded over regular slash irregular intervals of time? very um, obvious clue <laughs> in this answer, but I'm glad to see that everyone is on the right track. You would be right in saying that time series data is data that is recorded over regular intervals of time. 
I think there are still votes going through, but yes, this is the, the, the summary for time series data. We'll just let people finish off their votes. I don't want to cut anyone off. <laughs> so now we know what time series data is. Do you think that you could explain what a cross-sectional data is? You know, how does this differ to a time series data? Can you again match the correct definition? Got a mix of answers, that's good. I'm glad no one's selected option three, which means we're paying attention. <laughs> Got majority of votes saying that cross-sectional data consists of several variables recorded at the same time. And yes, you would be right. Sorry to the two votes who um, answered the, the middle definition, but yeah, cross-sectional data, the, the, this is a result of um, a data collection carried out at a single point in time on a statistical unit. So with cross-sectional data, you're not really interested in the change of data over time, but in the current you know, valid opinion of the respondents about a question in a survey. Uh, with cross-sectional data, you know, the ordering of the data does not matter in that you can have the data you know, ascending, descending, you could even have it randomized and this will not affect our modeling results. But with time series data, the order of your data is key. And lastly, what about pooled data? Can you go ahead and match that definition to pooled data? Should have possibly included an option for not sure, but um, if you're not sure, then take a, take a guess. Sweet, so we've got the majority of answers uh, saying that pool data is a combination of both time series and cross-sectional data. If you had selected this answer, well done. Um, so in short, yes, pool data occurs when we have a time series of cross-sections, but the observations in each cross-section do not necessarily refer to the same unit. So I can, uh, yeah, let me give you an example so that's a bit easier to understand. Let's say we take household income data on households X, Y, and Z in 1995, and then you take the same income data on households A, B, and C in 1998. So although you're interested in the same data, we're taking different samples, that's the different households from different time periods, and that makes it pooled data. And just for anyone interested, the where we have uh, five votes in that is data that is collected sequentially from the same respondents over time. Uh, this is actually longitudinal data, also known as panel data. Um, yeah, so panel data is a data set that consists of observations of multiple individuals obtained at multiple time intervals. Time series data focuses on single individuals, while panel data slash longitudinal data focuses on multiple individuals. So yeah, that's the main differences between time series data and other common data formats. But I've come up with a scenario that allows you to think about this in a little bit more detail. So imagine you have been asked to maintain a web application. You've been asked to analyze when a new user logs in. So you're interested in analyzing like login activity. Now, after some careful consideration, you've realized that there are two ways to do this. Option A is that when a new user logs in, you may just update that last login time step for that user in a single row. Or option B, you treat each login as a separate event. So if this was up to you and you have been asked to analyze login activity, which option do you think you would collect your data? How would you collect your data? Would this be A or B? So go ahead and pop in your answer for Mentimeters again. I thought we were going to have a split vote there, but oh. It's absolutely okay to not be sure. So yeah, props to you if you are saying not sure. We will discuss and uh, we'll discuss the differences once the rest of the polls come through. But it looks like the majority of people so far are suggesting to treat each login as a separate event. I'll let you just keep thinking about this for 10 seconds and then I'll move on to uh, talk about the answer. I quite like this visualisation, <laughs> but yeah, 68% of people have decided to treat each login as a separate event. 
let's have a look at what option A might look like before. If you had chosen option A, which I think was about 14% of you, um, this is typical of a cross-sectional data set. So we have the user and we have the last login time step. How, like, although this, this information is useful in examining which user works what company, that time variable isn't of much use here. You know, it simply provides some context, some attribute information. There's nothing really about changes here between um, users. If we went for option B, we might have something that looks like this instead. In this instance, we have a new row for each time a user has logged in where the changes are preserved, keyword. Each change is recorded as a new event. And doing this allows us to then examine the frequency of login activity over time. Uh, so yeah, I just wanted to draw attention to data collection because this kind of helps to understand what a uh, time series data looks like. And to summarize, almost all data is recorded as a new entry. The data typically arrives in time order and the time intervals can be regular or irregular. If a, um, just for some context, if a data set has irregular intervals, then this means that the events then become unpredictable and cannot be modeled or forecasted. And this is because forecasting assumes that whatever happened in the past is a good indicator of what will happen in the future. All right, so we're going to move on to looking at time series analysis now. There are many types of analysis to consider, but the three kind of main examples include visualization, decomposition, and autocorrelation. The graph on the right is a basic time series graph which allows you to plot the observed values on the y-axis against an increment of time on the x-axis. Now, most time series graphics will look something like this. And this is because the statistical characteristics of a time series data tend to violate the assumptions of conventional statistical methods. And because of this, analyzing time series data then requires a very unique set of tools and methods, which are known as time series analysis. Um, <clears throat> so let's explore some of the reasons why you might want to use a time series analysis. You could be interested in accessing the impact of a single event. So this could be very much a descriptive analysis. An example of this would be um, possibly identifying the number of crimes in Manchester, specifically looking for an upward or downward trend. That would very much be a descriptive um, analysis. Maybe you're interested in studying causal patterns, so to look at the effects of variables rather than the events themselves. This is kind of a way to like understand the data and the relationship within it, as well as possibly establishing a uh, cause and effect. Maybe you're interested in how to forecast future values of a time series, so this would very much be a prediction analysis. <clears throat> An example of a prediction would be using previous crime data to predict future crime trends, right? Now, obviously, it goes without saying that these aims can quite easily overlap when working on a research project. You'll probably be answering your questions, you know, using various aims and models. But these three aims kind of provide um, the aims that are expected in any kind of time series analysis. <clears throat> but these aims are not limited. There are other models that exist, such as classification, curve fitting, intervention analysis, and segmentation. These are complex models um, and kind of are dependent, again, on your data frame. It's dependent on whether you have a univariate or a multivariate data frame, if you have a regular or irregular time series, and a lot of things come into play. But one thing to note is that because time series analysis includes many categories or variations of data, typically the models do become quite complex. However, this doesn't mean that we can account for all variances and we can't really generalize a specific model to every sample. So that models that are too complex or that you know, try to do too many things can lead to a lack of fit. And the lack of fit or um, overfitting the model leads to those models not 
being able to distinguish between a random error and the true relationships, which can lead analysis quite skewed and maybe lead to incorrect forecasting. But I'm going to talk about an example from a paper that was able to demonstrate um, the benefits of forecasting and prediction in crime data. This was done by Ashby in 2020. He looked at the initial evidence on the relationship between the coronavirus pandemic and crime in the United States. So his aim was to understand crime patterns. And he used police recorded open crime data to understand how the frequency of certain crime types changed from the start of the pandemic. Now he used what is known as a Sarima model um, on the frequency of crime types in his 16 cities from 2016 to 2020. Forecasts were then created from these models to compare the actual um, crime calls to those that were expected, as in those that were forecasted. Now I would go through all the results and discussion, but obviously there's a, a lot to unpack here because he look, they looked at five different crime types across 16 different cities. But the main difference uh, was that the difference between the actual crimes recorded and those forecasted were different in each city. Uh, I remember the example of uh, theft being far lower than the forecasted crime trends. So this paper helped to identify a relationship between the pandemic and crime. So I've taken on a bit of an, of an, an adaptation from this, and we're going to be exploring a case study uh, that uses police recorded crime data but we want to explore just burglary rates from Detroit from 2015 to 2020. So our aim is to use time series graphics, that's the visualizations, time series analysis and forecasting to answer both these aims. So aim A is to explore the long-term trend and seasonality in burglary across the city of Detroit. So this would very much be your descriptive aim, highlighting the basic trends. And then we want to look at how the frequency of burglary changed in Detroit in 2020 from the start of the pandemic. And this falls between that explanatory and predictive aim. There are roughly like four steps in time series analysis, very, very simplified steps, but these are the, the steps needed. Your first step would be to explore your data. Your second step involves identifying and graphing these patterns. So that involves your visualizations. And your next steps would be to model the data. So applying, um, you know, the correct model. In our case, we're going to be following a Sarima model, which I discuss a little later on. And then you can run your predictions. So the first step involves exploring your data. But what does this actually mean in terms of time series data? Well, I've taken this screenshot from the data set that we'll be using on Thursday session in the code demonstration. And we have our date variable here. As you can see, we have our crime recorded by a daily rate. Um, but lucky, we don't, this doesn't mean that we have to use the daily date. Uh, we can aggregate our, our data frame so that we have the crime counts per week or the crime counts per month or the crime counts per year, the crime counts per six month, you know, the list goes on. But if you want to visualize something you know that looks like this what do you think is the most accurate interval for exploring crime data so if you want to head over to mentimeter uh, think about which interval you would use when exploring and and visualizing police recorded crime data i think i've given the option to choose up to four answers so go ahead and vote those four times if you're not too sure um and yeah we'll discuss some of the benefits and limitations of, of some of these. I'll give that about 30 seconds. Very interesting. We've got about 18 votes in with a pretty close split between monthly and weekly. But we're going to keep let, we're going to let this roll through because I'm interested to see where the average or the um, the polls have kind of slowed down, so I'll start to, to talk through some of the limitations and benefits, but can, feel free to continue putting in your answers. Um, so we've got seven vote, votes for yearly and quarterly. Um, 
Yeah, so year to year comparisons for crime data are very common. It's what you kind of see in government statistics, it's what you see across the across literature. But in recent years, um, comparing year to year data means that we tend to miss quite a bit of information as it hides variation that happens in the given months. Because if we were to compare, you know, 2015 to 2016 to 2017, how much uh, does that really tell us, you know? What can we then do with that information? In terms of crime prevention and policy, it'd be hard to detect um, specific trends in certain, in certain crime types if we're just looking from year to year because we're missing so much information. And this kind of stands for quarterly and six monthly data as well. What about uh, monthly data? Yeah, so we've got 15 votes for monthly data at the moment. And I would say that monthly data is, again, quite a common comparison in crime data. But at the same time, it can be quite inaccurate because months do not hold the same amount of dates. You know, we know that crime tends to be higher over the weekends and some months have longer number of weekdays than others. So how would this affect the frequency of crime rate? You know, would it be the... Yeah, so like, how would this affect the frequency of crime rate? Um, and this kind of leads us on to a smaller interval, which is the weekly crime data. Uh, this was mentioned in uh, Ashby's paper, who mentioned that week to week comparisons probably provide one of the best time intervals for crime data because it helps to reduce some of that uncontrolled variation. Comparing week to week data means that we can also incorporate things like bank holidays and specific holidays into those weeks that might be affected, that might be affecting those frequency of certain crime rates. Uh, daily data, again, this could be effective, but it might just kind of, it might mean that you're not, your data uh, obtains too much noise. It also means that studying things like seasonality uh, would be much harder. So yeah, uh, when working with crime data, I tend to use weekly because this helps to reduce some of the uncontrolled variation. So I went ahead and use weekly data, then plot a time series graph that looks something like this. So this addresses our AMA, which to which was to explore the long term trend in seasonality in burglary across the city of Detroit. So as you can see, we've got our weekly incidents and we've got our time interval on the bottom. Now, although this is written as, uh, you know, we've got 2015, 2016, 2017, each dot on the graph represents a new week. And this allows us to then explore, you know, variation within that year much clearly. We can see that there's a general decreasing trend from 2015 to 20. And there are some spikes and peaks in the data set as well. So at the start of the year, it seems that uh, burglary decreases and then starts to increase towards the end of the year. But why exactly you know, is this? This is the next question you'd want to ask. <clears throat> but if you want to explore these trends further, then this is where you need to look at the components of a time series analysis, because a variation of these components causes the changes in the patterns of a time series. There are four components that make up a time series analysis. We have our trend, which was already mentioned, but this is the linearity. Is the data increasing or decreasing? We then have our cyclic variation or cyclic variation, and this is the variation in a time series which operate themselves over a span of more than two years. We then have seasonality or seasonal variation, and yeah, these are the rhythmic forces which operate in a regular or periodic manner over a, over a span of less than a year. So that's the main difference between cyclic and seasonality. Um, and then we have our random or irregular movements such as noise. So this is the variation that cannot be explained. It's important to note that your noise or your irregular movements or your, your random errors, these are synonymous terms, by the way, is likely to be higher when analyzing shorter time periods. That is if you have a smaller data frame, because it means that your models aren't gonna be able to establish uh, a correlation between the lags and different time steps. 
So yes, the combination of these components with time, of course, causes the formation of a time series. Um, we can look specifically at these components by decomposing our trends, also known as a decomposition. And the decomposition is simply a way to split a time series graph into these four components. And this is what a decomposition plot would look like uh, made, from, made in R. We have four graphs. The top graph highlights our raw data, that's the, the raw counts. We then have our trend present. And so yes, we were right to say that we have an overall decreasing trend. And then we have our seasonal variation. So you might be able to see that we have a same, the same seasonal pattern from each year or very similar seasonal pattern from each year, um, which would indicate that there is season, there is a seasonal variation in our data set. Um, one of the main objectives for a decomposition is to estimate the seasonal effects that can be used to create and present seasonally adjusted values. And a seasonally adjusted value simply removes that seasonal effect so that the trends can be seen more clearly. Uh, I, I'll give an example of this. So violent crimes, for example, uh, tend to increase in the summer due to many factors, you know, there, there's there's increase of football games, there's increases in routine activities. Um, and thus to see where there is a real trend, we should adjust for the fact that violent crime is always going to be higher in the summer than in winter. And this is what this decomposition plot allows us to do. There are also uh, two structures to a decomposition plot, which I won't spend too much time on, but it's important to know. And these are known as an additive and a multiplicative plot. So an additive plot in the name simply add, adds these components and a multiplicative plot simply multiplies these components. Now, it's important to know that most packages will determine what type of decomposition structure you have, whether that be additive or multiplicative. You won't necessarily have to establish this yourself as most packages will tell you. Um, but let's explain uh, what I well, let's give you an example of what this the, what the two plots look like side by side. So on the left we have the additive plot. We can see the time series is uh, increasing. Uh, yeah, so it's increasing throughout, but the amplitudes and the frequency kind of stay the same as we increase. This could also decrease, by the way, but yeah. And then we have a multiplicative plot. So this is if the time series has an expansion, um, has a growth or a decline with time, then the time series can be considered to be multiplicative. And this is that we have changes in our uh, amplitude or frequency over time. And this is what the structure look like. So with our example, do you think that we tend to follow more of an additive plot or more of a multiplicative? multiplicative plot, a very difficult word to say, I apologize. Um, so yeah, just take a quick look at this and do you think this kind of follows um, an additive or multiplicative in that are our components being added at this point or they're being multiplied? You can pop your answer into Mentimeter if you wish. Got a mix of answers here. We have the majority suggesting additive, but there's also very close call between maybe both, both the multiplicative. Um, but yeah, we'll move on. So as I mentioned, when working in our studio, typically you'll be told what type of structure you have. And in this instance, this was actually a multiplicative plot. Um, I didn't supply this title here. This was given in the package that I used. Uh, so as you can see, our the reason this is multiplicative is because we had a, you know, we had a decreasing trend, but the amplitudes between our weekly points were different. There was no consistency in those in those weekly trends, right? The last thing to know um, with your time series analysis is that you need to ensure that your data is stationary. And this means that the properties such as mean, variance, and covariance tend to remain constant over time. Um, typically, a stationary data is very like flat looking. It doesn't have a trend, 
and it doesn't have a trend, there's no constant variance, there's no constant autocorrelation structure. And uh, doing this means that the model can do predictions based on the fact that the mean and the variance will then remain the same in the future periods. So yes, you have to make sure your data is stationary. There's two ways to do this, which is visually via the decomposition plots. Obviously they can be a bit difficult to read. Uh, so I tend to run statistical tests such as the KP PSS test, and there are loads of others available. But before modeling your data, you have to make sure that this is stationary and you can apply what is known as a differencing technique to make your data stationary. But again, this kind of goes beyond the scope of this talk. Um, so we're going to move on to looking at different models of time series and talk a little bit about our Serima models. So there are three main time series models. Um, we have what are known as moving averages, smoothing models, and cerebral models. So these are just three very common time series models. Um, but a moving average model is simply a series created from the average of the past values. A smoothing models are values calculated from the weighted average of past values. And there are extensions to, to smoothing. So there's a single, double, or triple. And these all depend on whether your data includes a trend, whether your data includes seasonality. And yes. And then we have what are known as ARIMA slash SERIMA models. So these are suitable for multivariate non-stationary data. So yeah, we'll be using a variation of this model to address our second aim, which asks how uh, burglary trends compared, to how uh, the rate of burglary trends compared to the predicted trends over the pandemic. So a Serima model is based on the concepts of both moving averages, autocorrelation and autoregression. So it provides a much more accurate model which then will allow you to make much more accurate forecasts. A CEREMA model stands for a seasonal autoregressive integrated moving average, which is a very long term, but it's a form of regression analysis that evaluates the strength of the dependent variable relative to other changing variables. So why would you want to use the CEREMA model? In short, it's used to understand past data or to predict future data in a series. And yes, as I said, they form a generalization from moving averages and make the model more uh, like effective, more accurate. For any kind of stats heads in the room, this is a quite um, complicated and extensive slide. Excuse me, I'm just getting a drink. Um, but yeah, and a Serima model is simply an extension of an Arima model. This means that when your data has a seasonal component, you're most likely going to use a Serima model. If your data doesn't have a seasonal component, then you'll use an Arima model. Now, there are three elements that make up an Arima model, and these are known as your PDQ. Now, I won't go into too much detail about this because, again, it falls a bit beyond the scope of this talk, but a, a P, uh, the, the the P stands for the um, autoregressive model. The D then stands for the differencing, which is um, how to make your data, um, how to make your data stationary. So an ARIMA model will do this for you, which means you don't need to do any data pre-processing before. And then you have your MA, which is that moving average model. And when we move on to our CEREMA model, you can see that we have the same letters, but just capitalized. And this just references the seasonal aspects of these three elements. We also have our M value, and this indicates the number of time steps for a single period. So if you were working with uh, yearly data, if, you're, if your data was, was yearly, then this number would be referenced by a 52. If you're working with uh, weekly data, sorry, I got that mixed up. <laughs> If you're working with weekly data, your your the reference will be 52. If you're working with monthly data, this will be referenced by a 12. If you're if you're working with quarterly data, this will reference be referenced by a four, and so on, so on. But again, there are packages in R that will um, 
establish these values for you so you won't have to calculate them yourself, which is very useful. But if you are interested in how you would choose these values for PDQ and your seasonal PDQs, you would have to use what is known as the ACF and the PACF. The ACF, in short, just tells us how correlated a time series is to its previous values. It's the correlation between observations of a time series separated by uh, like k time units. And then you have your partial autocorrelation, which is, um, this simply measures the strength of that relationship with other terms being accounted for. So yeah, that is a full kind of structure and breakdown of a Cerimo model. Um, and let's have a look at how we then can apply this Cerimo, Cerimo model to question, to answer our second aim. Again, I've created a kind of like step-by-step -step guide on how we could go about answering this aim. But the first steps would be to count that weekly crime. Um, this was, you know, back in the beginning of the slide where we decided on a time interval. Once this time interval has been decided, you need to aggregate your data to, to, to that weekly crime rate. Your next steps would be to model the weekly calls. And you can use the function ARIMA from the Fable package, which we'll be doing on Thursday. And then we can generate the forecasts from these models. And finally, your last steps involves plotting the forecasts, making those visualizations. So I've created some images that kind of help to explain these four steps a little bit better, because I understand it can be quite confusing. So if we were to follow these steps uh, with some graphics, your first steps would be, as I discussed, counting the crime. So this involved our time series plot that we made at the beginning. This was our time, our basic time series plot, where we have the frequency of crime rate plotted from 2015 to 2020. Following step number two, this is where you model the crime. So your Serena model takes place on your existing data and it almost establishes that average trend, the average seasonality, the average noise, the average cyclic behavior to make its own, um, to make its own, what's the word? <laughs> I've lost the word, but yeah, makes its own trend. Let's call it a trend. And from there, you can then forecast from this model. So this is what we would expect to happen. This is the prediction. This is where we think the trend will be going based on the data from the Serena models. And from there, you then compare your forecasted crime counts um, to the expected crime counts. This was very similar to Ashby's uh, paper. And yeah, this was the kind of structure that he showed. And it's really informative, especially when understanding uh, crime trends and cause and effects and correlation and, and whatnot. So I went ahead and created this plot in R and I was able to compare our rate of burglary in 2020 compared to the uh, expected crime count. So let's have a look at what that will look like. Before addressing the graph itself, you may have noticed the Serema structure at the top. And again, this was automatically created by R. This told me what I needed to do. It tells me how many steps in differencing I needed. It tells me um, my M value. And yeah, that's the breakdown. So if you ever see something like that, you know that you're dealing with... Um, you know what those values now represent, the PDQs, the autocorrelation, the autoregression, and the moving average. But back to the graph. So i am uh, only showing the, the last part of the, the graph, so from 2020 to 2021. And as you can see, we have uh, two kind of lines in this graph. We have this dotted line in between this gray bracket, and this is the predicted crime rate made from our ARIMA models. And below this, we have our, um, this, these were the recorded crimes. So these are the actual crimes that happened compared to our predicted. So this is where we expected the trend to go in 2020, but this is where the trend actually went. So as you can see, burglary rates fall a little bit uh, lower than are expected. And this is where you start to question why, you know, can we say that this is because 
like can we pin this all on COVID? Are there other factors at hand? But um, yeah, in, in this instance, the in Detroit, the COVID-19 pandemic led to substantial changes in daily activities of, of millions of Americans, you know, just like in the UK. But businesses and schools were closed, public events were cancelled, states start, started introducing stay-at-home orders, distancing was then a thing. And, you know, this led to a reduction in people's routine activities, which arguably could lead to a reduction in opportunities to then commit these crimes. Because if more people are staying at home, there's less opportunity for these crimes to take place. Um, so, yeah, this was our predicted model. I hope I was able to show you uh, the benefits of running a room, a room of models and why this is useful, and especially in the world of crime. So that, yeah, that draws conclusion, but just briefly, while I look at the time, we've got five minutes, that's no problem. But yeah, there's loads of softwares and applications available for time series. Obviously, I've been working in R and the code demo will be also conducted in R on Thursday, but there are packages like Python and FB Profit, which uh, was actually developed by by Facebook, but it's a forecasting tool available in both Python and R. It's typically used for like additive models with a non-linear trend. Uh, so that's the yearly, weekly, daily, and seasonal trends. Um, but the benefit is that everything's completely automated. You don't have to kind of do any coding. You just need to plug in your data. So you know if you want to start there rather than coding, then that would that would be the place for you. And just out of interest, out of uh, curiosity, can I ask what software programs uh, you tend to use? Um, this be it time, be it for for just time series analysis, or for kind of anything that you do. I'd be really interested to know. Uh, I've left this as a word cloud, so we're going to see what happens here. This is very interesting. R and Python are sitting on um very similar similar sizes, but I'm not sure what eViews is. I've actually never heard of eViews, um, but yeah, R and Python and Excel starter are all definitely very common applications for, for running time series. Um, but thank you for taking part in that. That was just kind of me being curious. Um, material for the code demonstration on Thursday uh, can be found in our GitHub link. If uh, Emma or Julia or Louise, whoever's available, could pop that into the group chat again. Much appreciated. I would suggest uh, viewing the intro and prerequisites information slide on there. It shows you how to set up or clone a repository, as well as uh, how to use interactive binder materials. But I will also be discussing how to do all of that at the start of the session, so don't feel too stressed. Uh, resources will be shared once the slide decks are shared. I believe I'll be adding the slide decks on Thursday to the GitHub repo. Um, but thank you all for attending. If you do have any further questions that I haven't had a chance to address here, please send me an email and I'll do my best to reply to you. Um, yeah, so thank you all for attending.